things uh, this morning and so grateful. Welcome to Community Church Oshkosh. Happy Mother's Day. It is so good. It is so good to be gathering together and celebrating uh, all that moms mean to us. And uh, um, those of you who are joining us online, welcome as well. And uh, we've been in a series uh, called Unshakable as we've been journeying through the book of Hebrews and looking at what it means for us as followers of Jesus, as men and women of Christ, uh, to follow Jesus when things feel like they're falling apart. Because it, essentially the author of Hebrews writes this letter to this group of Christians who is struggling. And, and so we can relate with some of these things because we've struggled, amen? Like, they're not the only ones who have gone through uh, those types of things. And so we need to hear these words as well. And so we come to Hebrews chapter 11, the famous chapter uh, of story after story after story of people of faith who've gone before us. Now, here's the crazy part, right? We think of Hebrews chapter 11, and we think, man, these are the superheroes of faith. These are the people that have gone before us, and these are the, the ones that are wearing capes, and like they're amazing, and they're untouchable, and how could we ever be like them? And then we read their story, and we're like, oh no, we're just like them, and they're just like us. And, and so here's just, I'm so excited. Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to break this down into an entire summer series, and we're calling it Flawed. Because there's all these men and women who are flawed people, and everybody said, amen, amen right? Like, we get to look at those people and be like, okay, they're, it's okay. Like, I can be a mess, and God can still use me, amen? amen. And, and so what we're going to do for our summer series, and we're starting in June, um, is we're going to do this series called Flawed, and we're going to go through each person uh, through the book of Hebrews chapter, or the chapter 11 of Hebrews, and we're going to look at all of them and, and see how God can make the most out of our mess. All in favor of that? Like, we're ready for that, right? And, uh, and so today what I want to do is I want to take one character, as you've already heard, I want to take one character out of Hebrews chapter 11, and I want to talk about her today. Because I think it's important on Mother's Day uh, to get a picture, to get an idea of what it means to be a woman of faith who actually struggled with doubt. A woman of faith who struggled with doubt. Anybody in here? We got any of those in here? Right? And the, and the reality is, is sometimes we look at these people and, and we're like, oh, if, if her name is in Hebrews 11, then she had to be amazing. And what we're going to find out today is, yes, she was amazing. But, but part of what we're going to find out today is that she struggled just like we do. She struggled with doubt. And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 18, we're going to get an idea of, of this story of this woman who struggled and wrestled with doubt, and, and God was able to continue to work through her and in her, even in the midst of those doubts. So I'm going to tell you right off the bat, okay? I, I am not going to, uh, one of the things that I'm not going to do is I'm not going to say, hey, here's six easy steps uh, to overcome doubt. Okay? The reality is, is if I could do that, I wouldn't be here. I would have written a book and I'd be on a yacht somewhere. Okay? But the reality is, is we, we don't have those answers because we all have different stories. We all have different things that we struggle with and, and that we doubt. And here's what I want to do today. I want to show you today how one woman, one mom in scripture dealt with her doubts. Now, if someone tells you that they never struggle with doubt, okay, so if someone literally comes up to you, I just never struggle with doubt. Listen, they're either lying or that's Jesus. And so, so either they're lying or you need to fall down and worship him, okay? Because we all struggle with doubt. And, and I know, listen, I know that there are people in this room right now that, that have these doubts in their mind. And maybe it's some relationship thing that you're walking through. Maybe it's some physical illness thing that you're walking through. But, but there are these thoughts in your mind right now, like, why, why is this so hard? Why hasn't God answered this prayer? Why hasn't God mended this relationship? Is there something that I said? Is there something that I didn't say? Is there something I did? Is there something I didn't do? And you have all of these doubts. And God wants to meet you where you're at today as we look at Sarah's story and see what it is that God has for us. So I believe that God wants to speak to us today. And so I want to pray, 
that you would hear from God today, that I would just be a, a megaphone for what God wants to say to you today. So can I pray for you in that way today? Let me pray. Father, I thank you so much. God, I thank you that you still speak today. And Lord, I'm praying that as we dig into your word, as we understand what it means to be people of faith, unshakable faith, even when we wrestle with doubts, God, that you would help us to hear from you today. God, that maybe there's something specific that, that people need to hear today. And so I pray that you would open their hearts and their minds, that we might see and hear all that you have for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Genesis 18, <clears throat> she wanted one thing in life. She wanted one thing in life. Have you ever felt like that? Like, God, I don't, I'm not asking for a lot. I just want one thing. I'm just asking that you do this one thing. And she wanted one thing in life, and that was to have a child. And she marries this guy. So here's the crazy part, right? She wants to have a child, and she marries a guy whose name means exalted father. And so like in her mind, she's like, listen, I want to have a child. I married a guy. His name is exalted father. Boom. This is going to happen. Like how can this not happen? And not only that, but then in Genesis 15, God comes to Abram, whose name means exalted father, and says, your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars. So now she's like, listen, I want a child. I marry a guy. His name is Exalted Father. Check the box. Check the box. God makes a promise that I'm going to have all these descendants. Check, check, check. Years go by. Still no babies. God comes in Genesis 17 to Abram and he says, Abram, I'm going to change your name. Remember that promise that I made you? children, descendants, as numerous as the stars. I'm going to change your name. Not, so now it's not just exalted father, it's father of many. And so now here's this other promise. And over and over again, and still, no babies. Father of many, and she can't even have one. And on top of that, God changes her name. From Sarai to Sarah, which means mother of nations. It had to feel like God was making a lot of empty promises. You ever felt like that? Like God has promised some things, He said some things, like, and you're holding on to those coffee cup verses, right? And you're like, I will, I will prosper you. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. I will be with you wherever you go. And you feel like, where are you, God? You promised that you would be near me. And we hold on to these promises. And then they start to feel like empty promises. By the time that God changed her name to Sarah, she had already given up hope. Like like this wasn't, listen, she wasn't like 25. This was years and years and years. And and so by the time that God comes and says, I'm going to change your name to Sarah, she's like, it's too late. It's too late. People are beginning to whisper those dreaded words to this woman that so desperately wants to have a child, barren, infertility. And yet God keeps filling her mind with these promises. 24 years go by since God made this promise to the couple. Now now think about it. And, and the, the, the passage that was read is very clear. That, that she's not just, she has gone beyond like the normal childbearing years. She has passed menopause and she has gone beyond menopause. Like, like there is no scientific way possible for her to have a child. Genesis 18. This is where we pick up the story. Three strangers show up at Abraham and Sarah's tent. And, and Abraham is outside and, he, and he's talking with these strangers and, and Sarah is in the tent and she's preparing food and, and she's, she's got this gift of hospitality. She's like, I'm going to get some tea ready and I'm going to get some food ready and I just want these people to feel welcomed and cared for. They're strangers. 
And then she hears through the tent flap this conversation in Genesis 18, starting in verse 9. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she's in the tent. So she hears her name, right? She's cooking food. She's getting stuff ready. And and she hears her name. She's in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Promises, promises. Right? Empty promises. I've heard these promises. It goes on to say this, verse, uh, verse 10. The Lord said, I will surely return. Verse 11. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women, this is a real... Interesting, you can do the deep dive on this one. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah, what? What's it say? So Sarah laughed. Now, she's, she's hearing these strangers say these words and make these empty promises, and she's looking at her old, weary body, and she's like, there is no way. And the kind of laugh, right, the kind of laugh that she describes, it's not a laugh of joy, it's not a laugh of you know, somebody told a joke. It's not a laugh. It's, it's the kind of laugh like when people say, the Lions are going to win the Super Bowl. <laughs> it's that kind of laugh, right? That you, you laugh out of, out of someone else's expense. And, and this is how she's laughing. She's like, there is no way. She's laughing because it's impossible. She's laughing because it's unbelievable. She's laughing because there's something in front of her as she's looking at her body. She's like, this is immovable. There is no way that you can change this. And she laughs. Sarah hears God's plan for her and she laughs. Have you ever felt like that? Like, I don't know, like, if you've, if you've ever been in a place where you felt like God was asking you to do something, telling you to do something, and you were like, there is no way, God. And you just laugh. Like, this is impossible. Have you ever felt like you had a dream that was so extravagant or so impossible or an obstacle that seemed uh, insurmountable or uh, immovable? Or you felt like there's this pain that I have that will never go away. It's a physical pain or it's an emotional pain. And I have this pain and it's never going to go away. I've had this for so long. And I've prayed and I've asked God to take it away. And just like Sarah, you look at your life and you laugh. Because you feel like there is no way. And and this laughter that Sarah had is, we're going to call it, so you can write this down, but it's the laughter of unbelief. It's the laughter of doubt that there's things in our life where where we laugh at it and we're like, there is no way, it's impossible. I I want you to hear this this morning because I think this is important for us to understand. We may laugh at the promises of God, but I believe that God laughs at our doubt. Like, I, I think that there's part of us, right, that when we hear things that, that seem impossible or extravagant or, or immovable, that we laugh at those things, and we laugh doubting God. And, and God, in that very moment, is laughing at our doubt. I think of um, Jesus with the disciples in, in the boat, right, and Jesus is sleeping, and there's this huge storm, and the boat's all over the place, and water's coming in, and, and what do the disciples do? They run to Jesus, right? And they're shaking. They're like, Master, Master, Lord, you've got a teacher. You've got to wake up. And Jesus wakes up and he says these words. Now listen, I'm, I'm putting my opinion and, and my ideas of how I think this went down, but I believe Jesus, when he looks at them and says, you have little faith, there was a chuckle. Because think about it for a moment. This is the one who Colossians chapter 1 says created everything. The one who spoke everything into existence and they're freaking out about a storm and he's like, you you of little faith, you do not get it. And in a moment he speaks and everything goes still. And I believe the same way that Sarah laughs at 
a, a laughter of unbelief, a laughter of doubt at what God can do. And I believe that there's part of God that's like, oh, you have no idea. Look what it says. Verse 13. The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Why are you laughing, Sarah? Why are you laughing, Sarah? God, I want you to understand. And, and he asks her a question. And, and listen, this, I, want, I want you to personalize this question this morning. Because I want you to think about how Sarah, when she's asked this question, how does she respond? But look what it says in verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? If I look at you, if God comes to you today and says, is anything too hard for me? What's your answer? What's your answer? What's your answer? No, no listen, you're not, listen, they're in, a, in a second, you shouldn't even hesitate. What is happening? Like you, like if God comes to you and says, is anything too hard for me? In, like in a second, you should be like, no, absolutely not. There is nothing too hard for you. And God looks at you and he looks at me and he says, then why are you living like things are too hard for me? Because that's, we call that practical atheism. Like we believe that there's nothing too hard for God and yet we live like there's a lot of things that are too hard for God. In the way that we pray, in the way that we talk, in the way that we live. Is anything too hard for the Lord? The answer is no. God confronts Sarah's doubt with a question. He confronts her doubts with a question. God says, is anything too hard for the Lord? Now, if God would have said to Sarah, Sarah, do you believe that it's possible for you to bear a child at 90 years old? What would her answer have been? No. Sarah, is anything too hard for God? No. Very different answers. Very different answers. It's the same answer, but it's very different answers. We are no different. We are no different than Sarah. If you were asked, can God do anything, you would answer yes. But you and I have to admit that, that we live like God can't do those things. There's no way. God could never reach my neighbor. God could never mend that broken relationship. God could never save my marriage. Anytime you start a sentence with, God can never. You need to ask the question, what is it? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I believe that there is nothing in your life, we can argue about this, because you have the right to be wrong, I believe, I believe that there is nothing in your life that God would look at. So I want you to think about the most impossible thing in your life, the, 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 the most difficult thing, the thing that you are facing, and you're like, there is no way that God can. I believe that there's nothing in your life that God would look at and be like, I don't know if I could pull that off. There's nothing that you are facing, there is nothing that, is, that, that God would look at and be like, there, I, I don't know if I could do that. That looks really hard. Nothing. And Sarah knew it. Look at verse 15. This is how, she, this is how we know she knew it. <coughs> but Sarah denied it. So God says, is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, you shall have a son. But Sarah denied it. She's like, I didn't, I didn't laugh. I didn't laugh. 
for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. And he's laughing at her doubts. No, but Sarah, you did laugh. Once Sarah heard God's question, she immediately felt like an idiot. No, no, I didn't laugh. Because she knew that nothing was impossible with God. She knew that the God who created everything out of nothing could place a baby in her womb. She knew it. And and here's the reality. That is the answer to our doubts. Do do you understand it? And I know this is like kindergarten Christianity and this is going to be super easy and be like, really, we came here for this today? But here's the reality. The answer to our doubts is faith. The answer to our doubts is belief. Faith, faith is not the absence of doubt. So, so it's not like you saying, well, if I just have faith, then I'll never have doubts again. Does that ever happen to anybody in this room? Well, if I just have faith, then I'll never, I'll never question again. I'll never have doubts again. No, that's not true. Faith is not the absence of doubt. It's the presence of God. Here's, here's what I want you to see in Genesis chapter 21. So Sarah laughs out of unbelief. It's a laugh of unbelief. It's a laugh of doubt. She laughs another time in Scripture, and it's very different. Genesis chapter 21, God comes through on His promise, and she has a son, and they name him Isaac. And in Genesis 21, verse 6, it says this. Listen to what she says. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. God has taken my laughter of doubt, my laughter of unbelief, and he has given me a laughter of faith, a laughter of belief. Did it come from her? Where did she say it came from? Where did it come from? It came from God. Listen, this this has it. She's like, listen, I, I spent the last year kind of building up my faith, and now I got this. No, she's like, listen, God gave me faith. Some of us need to pray that today. Say, God, would you just give me faith? God, would you give me what I, what I can't do on my own? Faith is not the absence of God. It is the presence of God. And she laughs for joy at the faithfulness of God. She laughs for joy because of God's faithfulness. Hebrews chapter 11. This is where we go. Hebrews chapter 11 Verse 11, one verse. This is what you need to see. Hebrews 11, verse 11, it says this. By faith, okay, that's key. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive. The omnipotent God, the all-powerful God, because of Sarah's faith, because of her belief, God gave her power to be able to have a child at 90 years old. How powerful is God? I mean, if God says, is anything too hard for the Lord, and you're like, well, she's 90 years old, God, there's no way she can have a baby. Oh, whoops, she's pregnant. Like, the omnipotent power of God gave her the ability because of her faith, because of her belief. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she considered, here it is, since she considered him faithful who had promised. She considered God. Listen, she didn't consider her circumstances. She didn't consider the medical reasoning. She didn't consider, she she considered God. She lifted her eyes from her circumstances and she considered God and she thought, is anything too hard for the Lord? No. Why would I not trust Him? As the worship team comes up, I, I just want you to think about this for a moment. Genesis 15, God makes a promise to Abraham. Genesis 17, he 
he reaffirms that promise. Genesis 18, she laughs at the promise. But here's the reality. We have an um, um, uh, omnipresent God. What does that mean? God is everywhere, but not just in space. God is everywhere in time. So God, in Genesis 18, says, you're going to have a baby. God, in Genesis 15, says, your descendants are going to be as numerous as the the stars. And where is God already? God's already in Genesis 21. God is already in Genesis 21 in that moment when she gives birth to Isaac, and God is like, listen, you just got to trust me. Like, you have no idea what's going to happen between Genesis 15 and Genesis 21, and you need to trust me. I think it's important for us to remember that God can do anything. Doesn't always mean God will. And and I want you to understand the reality of that. And some of you, I don't have to tell you because you know. Like you know because you've had a miscarriage. You know because you haven't been able to have children. You know because you have cancer. And listen, all the time, God has been watching all of these things happen. And and that not at, at one point did God ever say, oops. Faith is not the absence of doubt. Faith is not the absence of pain. Faith is not the absence of hurt. Faith is not the absence of, you fill in the blank but it's the presence of God, the presence of God in that moment. He's there with you when you have that miscarriage. He's there with you when you hear the doctor say you have terminal cancer. He's there with you. Listen, his presence is what's important. And I, and I can't speak this for everybody, but that's the thing that I love about my mom. She's always there. I think it's a beautiful picture of what God does for us, that he says, listen, I'm going to be there. Even when you feel like I'm not there, I'm I'm always going to be there. I want to share a thought, and and, uh, I tried this in the first service, and I think they got it, and, and I know that you guys are smarter than them. So, there it is. We laugh because we doubt, or we laugh because we doubt it. There's a difference. We laugh because we doubt, or we laugh because we doubt it. When we laugh, we laugh because we doubt is, is directed towards someone else. Right? When someone says, you're going to have a child at 90 years old, we're laughing at them. We're laughing at what they're saying. We're laughing at that promise. Or, in Genesis 21, when you have a child, and then you're laughing at who? You're laughing at yourself because you doubted. You're laughing because you're like, I don't know why I ever doubted God. So my question to you this morning is this, is which which one? Are you going to be the person who's laughing because you doubt, or are you laughing because you doubt it? There's two words that I think probably went through Sarah's, the, the, the gamut of emotions that she was feeling all along. Two words that I think describe what she was experiencing. And the first one was this, unbelievable. 
Like this is unbelievable. God, there is, I don't believe it. There is no way that you can do this. It's impossible. And, and the other word is immovable. Like she's looking at her body and she's like, there's no way, God, that you can move this. There's no way that you can do this. And I believe that there's many of us in this room who are probably struggling with both of those things. God, I don't believe it. God, you can't move this. The last four letters of both of those words is what we need to remember. what we think is unbelievable, what we think is immovable, we need to believe that God is able. And I don't know where, again, I don't know where you're at. If you came in here today and you're wrestling with some of these things, here's what I want to do. I want to pray over you. The worship team wants to sing over you. And this song is really our prayer to God, but it's a prayer to ourselves where we're saying, God, I need to be reminded, God, I need to speak this into my own life, that I need to believe you. I need to believe for it. So God, would you help me have that kind of belief, that kind of faith? That even in the midst of my doubts, even in the midst of of all the things that I'm struggling with and wrestling with, that I believe that there is nothing too hard for you. So let me pray before we sing this together. Father, I come before you and I thank you, God, that that even in our doubts, even in our struggles, even in our pain, God, even in the midst of having questions that haven't been answered, God, that you would help us to trust you, that you would help us to, to be able to get to the place where we laugh because we doubt it. That we would get to a place where we would realize that, well, I don't know why I ever struggled with that because I know that God can do anything. So as we sing this, Lord, would you, would you help remind us of the fact that there is nothing too hard for you?